At this point in your physics career, you may know a great deal about light. You may know that it behaves like a wave sometimes and a particle other times. You might know about reflection and refraction and diffraction of light, and that we see when light uh, we see things when light reflects off of those things or when those things themselves emit light. Uh, but really, a fundamental question about light that I think a lot of people don't even think to ask is where does the light come from and where does it go? And this may seem like a really simple question. Well, it comes from the sun or it comes from a light bulb, but at a deeper level, why do those things emit light that we can see and other things don't emit light? And then when that light hits something and we can't see it anymore, where did it go? Well, we would say it gets absorbed, but what does that mean? What happens when the light gets absorbed? That's what emission and absorption of light is all about. Um, and we'll find that it really gets to um, atomic structure. Atomic structure has a lot to do with the emission and absorption of light. This is a representation of the Bohr model of, uh, of the atom, which is one that I'm sure you've seen before. Now, to start with, we know that this isn't really a great picture of how things look. So why do we keep using it? Well, it's useful. Uh, this organizes things simplistically so that we can see, well, we've got protons and neutrons in the middle of the atom in the nucleus. We've got electrons that uh, go around the nucleus. We say they orbit the nucleus, though the motion isn't quite as simple as like a uh, planet orbiting the sun or a satellite orbiting the earth. Uh, and then there are different places where those electrons can orbit. Different uh, energy levels get associated with those different places. So each of these red circles represents uh, a place where the electron can be. Now that's actually a finding of quantum physics that the electron can't be anywhere there. So we could orbit the Earth at any altitude if we just had the right speed. Uh, but uh, electrons have only certain locations where they can orbit. Uh, and that's, that's important for us. And just like orbiting the Earth, we find here that if, if we were trying to orbit the Earth and we wanted to get to a higher level and orbit at a higher altitude, we'd have to do a little work on our ship. We'd have to use our, you know, turn on our rockets for a little while to get up to that higher level. Um, and so we would say that that higher level then is associated with a higher energy state. And so uh, the, the same is true with these electrons. The higher they are, the farther they are away from the, the nucleus, uh, the higher energy state we're looking at. But remember, there are only certain places they can be, so there are only certain energy levels. Sometimes we simplify these drawings even further uh, by getting rid of the nucleus and just showing the energy levels for the electrons. And this is like a really, really zoomed in view so that uh, our uh, levels don't look like circles anymore. They look like just straight lines. And then typically the way we do this is the very bottom level is the lowest energy state that we can have. And we call that the ground state for an electron. Um, and then as we go higher and higher up, we get to higher energy states. And so we find that electrons can occupy different locations, but they're not stuck in that location indefinitely. An electron can, say, jump from the ground state to the next energy level up. We label these, just uh, number them uh, with the, the letter n on up. So n equals 1, equal, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4 here for as many energy levels as we have. Um, so we can go from the ground state to the n equals 1. An electron can go from the ground state to the n equals 1 state. Um, and that n equals 1 state has more energy associated with it. So in classical physics, we know that if we want to get something to a state where it has more energy, the only way to do that is to uh, do some work on it. We have to give it energy so that it can be at that higher energy state. So where does the electron get the energy? How does it get up to that higher state? Well, one way that it can get the energy is 
through a photon. We can have a photon come in and get absorbed by this electron, um, absorbed by the atom, causing the electron to jump up to this higher energy level. Now, we have to be careful here because this photon has a certain amount of energy associated with it, and that amount of energy has to, uh, has to be equal to the jump that we're going to make here. We still have this rule that energy has to be conserved. So if our energy from the photon is absorbed um, by this, this atom um, to move the electron up, we have to have the electron move up to an energy level that's the same amount of energy higher than what it was before. So if we give it, just to, to throw a number out here, this is a wildly wrong answer, but if we gave it a joule worth of energy, it would have to make a one joule jump upward. Now, because there are only certain places where the electron can be, there are only certain energy levels of photon that can get absorbed. So if this photon had an energy amount that wanted to take the electron to this spot right here, between n equals 1 and n equals 2, then that photon wouldn't get absorbed at all by this atom and by this electron. Um, so you might think, uh, well, can't can't the uh, can't the electron just you know make change, so to speak here? So jump up to a higher energy level and then send off the rest as a, a different photon. And we find that that actually doesn't happen. So if the photon isn't the right energy level to get this electron to jump to the first level or to the second level or to the third level, or to the fourth level, um, it doesn't get absorbed at all. Now we can do the opposite here. We can start at a high energy level and drop to a lower energy level. And we can make a big jump, or we can make a little jump here. Um, but what we find is that uh, when we fall down in energy, that electron has lost energy. Where does that energy go? Well, it turns into a photon. We emit a photon when an electron drops down to a lower energy level. And we have to absorb a photon to get that electron up to a higher energy level. Now this photon that's been emitted, it can go and get absorbed by a different, uh, by a different atom um, and cause an electron to jump up to a higher energy level. And this is happening all the time. Electrons are jumping up and down constantly. All electrons are doing this for all things. Everything is emitting light all the time. But most things, most things that aren't especially warm or energized electrically, they're emitting light that's just too low energy for us to see. So you and I and the floor and the ceiling are all emitting light, but it's probably in the infrared range, and our eyes aren't sensitive to that. So when there isn't an external light source like the sun or like a light bulb um, producing light that bounces off of these things, we can't see them in the absence of that light. They are emitting light, but not light that we can see. So in addition to having energy associated with these energy levels, uh, that the electrons can be in, we also have these individual photons, these little balls of light that have some amount of energy associated with them. So how do we know how much energy they have, or, or what factors influence how much energy they have? Well, it turns out it's really just one. The frequency of that photon determines the energy that it has. Higher energy photons have higher frequencies, and lower energy photons have lower frequencies. In fact, it's not even a complicated relationship. It is a linear relationship. We can say that the energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency. And what's the constant of proportionality there? Well, we're going to use an h for it. E equals h times f is how we'll write the equation for the energy of a photon. And then h is called Planck's constant. And if you look at your equation sheet uh, for Planck's constant, you'll see that there are two different values for Planck's constant. One of those values is 6.63 times 10 to the negative fourth joule seconds. 
And if we think about the units here, those make sense because the units for frequency are going to be hertz, which can be expressed as 1 over seconds, or seconds to the negative 1 power. So if we have joules times seconds times 1 divided by seconds, we'll end up just with joules for our energy unit. Now, with that 10 to the negative 40, uh, 34th um, power in there, these are really, really tiny numbers, and they're tricky to work with as a result. Um, so you know, aren't, aren't there any better, better units than this? Even if we have a high frequency for our light, you know, 10 to the 15th or 10 to the 20th power for frequency, we're still looking at you know, 10 to the negative 14th, 10 to the negative 20th power for uh, energy. So 10 to the negative 20th joules. How much energy of that? Man, that is tough to wrap your head around here. Um, and it turns out there are better units, and that's where we get into the second way of writing Planck's constant, which is 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15th EVS. Now, the S is seconds again, so we're okay with that, but what about this EV business? Turns out the name uh, electron volts actually describes quite well what, uh, what this unit is. So an electron volt is a, a unit to measure energy or work, and this is the amount of work that we would do if we used a one volt potential, uh, potential difference to accelerate an electron. So we connect, uh, say, a one volt battery to two metal plates, uh, one to the positive side and one to the negative side, and then we stick a negative electron right next to the negative plate. And then it gets pushed away from the negative side and pulled toward the positive side, and so it accelerates as it goes, and uh, it's going to get an energy of one electron volt. Well, how much is that? Well, we can look at the equation for work is equal to Q times delta V. And here our uh, Q value is the charge for an electron, so that's 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs times 1 volt. And so we get an amount here of 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs times volts, since volt is just a short way to write joules per coulomb, be coulombs times joules per coulomb, so it's just joules. And that's equal to one electron volt. So one electron volt, very small amount of energy, but it turns out it's, it's convenient to work with. When we look at those energy levels for, uh, for most atoms, we're going to be looking at the single and the double digits um, for electron volts. So between, uh, by, by convention, usually the highest energy level we'll call zero electron volts. And then the lowest energy level is going to be between, say, negative 10 and negative 20 electron volts for these things. So nice uh, small numbers that we have to work with then. So we'll see a bunch of these electron uh, energy level diagrams laid out this way, where we have energy listed now with zero up at the top, and then the lower energy levels are just going to be negative values. Um, and it's fine to have negative values for electric potential energy here, um, and uh, you know, we, we kind of get to choose what our, uh, uh, where our, our values are going to be uh, uh, zero. And so it makes sense on these ones to have zero be the high point, and then anything other than that, and we actually have an electron escaping from our, our atom. Um, we say the atom becomes ionized at that point, so sometimes that zero level is called the ionization energy. But let's just look at this transition. We have an electron jumping from the negative 1.5 electron volt level to the negative 9.0 electron volt level, and it's going to emit a photon when it does, and we want to know about that photon. So we have the equation E equals HF, and we know the, uh, the energy level for this photon has to be equal to the change in energy uh, for the electron. So the electron goes from negative 1.5 to negative 9, so the electron has lost 7.5 electron volts of energy. So that must mean the photon has 
positive 7.5 electron volts of energy. And we'll set that equal to H. Make sure we use the units that are consistent with the energy level. So that'll be 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15th electron volt seconds times F. And this is going to give us a frequency of 1.81 times 10 to the 15th hertz. Now more commonly we describe light in terms of its wavelength. Um, so let's do a quick calculation for that. We know the frequency. We know the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So we can just use the, uh, the equation V equals lambda F or this rearranges to lambda equals v over f. And so here our speed is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by the frequency, which we just calculate as 1.81 times 10 to the 15th. And the units there are hertz, or I'm going to write that as 1 over seconds, just so I can see how that cancels. And that'll leave me with just meters and I get a wavelength then of 1.66 times 10 to the negative second, seventh meters, or we often write that as uh, in nanometers. So that'd be 166 nanometers for the wavelength of the light that's produced, that's emitted when our electron drops from the one, negative 1 1.5 electron volt level to the negative 9 electron volt level. Thanks for watching this video. If you found it useful, please like or share the video so other people can find it as well. And if you think you'll find future videos from me useful, then please hit that subscribe button too. Thank you again.